Well, it's all over. Nine or so years of build-up, and it's done. What a strange sensation to reach the end of something and then feel like it's not the end. I suppose we should talk about it then. I'll talk about the episode itself and, and then my problem with what's happened with the series and then we're done here, folks. We can all go home to a better world and a better world where George has written the series himself and uh, he's released his latest two books and it's, it's a satisfying ending. So the episode starts by dedicating time to a long walk through the city, the destroyed city, to show the destruction that Danny caused. My criticism of this scene is that it doesn't really feel as if there's a connection to Danny in any way. I've discussed this in the last episode, so the, the justifications there, I, I don't think they built up the Mad Queen sufficiently. So when I'm seeing the actions of Daenerys, I'm not attributing it to Daenerys, I'm attributing it to the screenwriters instead. So it hit with a lot less emotional impact than if they'd properly built up the Mad Queen. In which case, this could have been a really stunning scene, but it just lacked a bit of gravitas. I suppose that's the episode in a nutshell. Lacked a bit of gravitas. After the long walk, Tyrion goes into the castle. Some nice shots of the, the ruined castle. He goes down into the dungeon where Jaime and Cersei try to escape. Spoiler alert for you who haven't seen the last episode. I presume you all have if you're here. If not, I... well, spoilers. Jaime and Cersei die, if you even know who they are. Jaime and Cersei crushed beneath rubble. The amount of rubble that was shown to have killed them and crushed them and the amount of rubble we see uh, in this episode is not is not comparable at all. The whole kingdom fell on them and now there's just a, a couple of bricks and Tyrion's freed them. I mean, bricks are still enough to kill a man, but I'm just saying I would have thought that they would have properly been buried. But they weren't, so Tyrion could come down and have this quite sad moment. I, I will give it to them for that. Tyrion, Peter Dinklage hits that emotional weight. If it weren't for his good acting skills, that scene would have felt a bit forced, but John and Onion Man, they go to see the rest of the city where Grey Worm is executing Lannister soldiers, the ones with enough plot armor to have survived the last episode and now killed. I think Grey Worm Props to the writers, Grey Worm was appropriately set up to have this arc, so I'll, I'll give them props for that. It felt like this is something Grey Worm would do, with Masande's death, meaning that Grey Worm is just ruthless and shows no mercy. And he, he fights for his own sense of justice now, he's, he's a vigilante like Batman. So I thought that was a neat little character arc for him, and it was appropriate. Queen Cersei, uh, oh, sorry, Queen Danny. <laughs> Oop, Freudian, Freudian slip there. Queen Danny stands in front of her entire army and says, "Well, we're gonna liberate the people like we liberated this kingdom." Yeah. Tyrion comes back to Queen Daenerys, takes off his hand of the king pin, and tosses it aside, and so she's like. Bitch, you see what I did to Varys? You're dead. You're dead, mate. And so that she has him imprisoned. John goes to see him. Another minor nitpick, but this has really been annoying me. Daenerys is someone who's gripped by paranoia. Reminds me of the King of China. You know, the one who took mercury pills because he thought they would give him immortality, but instead they just corroded his mind and he started hallucinating and becoming even more paranoid. Kind of like that. That's the, the vibe I get from Danny. It doesn't really make sense to me that she would be so trusting of everyone. Like, let, let's look at the last episode where Tyrion frees Jamie. 
Tyrion had just betrayed her trust. You don't think she would have, perhaps, I don't know, given the orders to her men to not let Tyrion anywhere near her brother Jaime? You don't think that ever crossed her mind, a paranoid who's constantly looking out for her own interests? She, don't, she didn't ever consider that Tyrion might go to see and free his brother, and she never gave the orders. Right, okay, whatever. You don't think that Jon, the true heir to the throne, would go to see the Hand of the King and talk to him? You don't think she'd try to stop Jon from going to see Tyrion? For some reason, someone who's so lacking in trust, trusts people a bit too much, which is a bit strange. But anyway, Jon goes down to see Tyrion and have a chat with him, and here's where we arrive at the central problem. Tyrion tries to get Jon on side, right? By, by telling him that the Mad Queen would not be a good ruler. No shit. And John keeps saying, No, she's my queen. Queen Danny! And flying her banner over the rooftops. Shouting her name. Like he's at a fan convention. Tyrion says no. And then he explains to, to John why Danny is the Mad Queen on why John should kill her. Here is my problem with this scene. So my first problem is that Tyrion is basically spending 10 minutes telling the audience that Danny is the Mad King, Queen, whatever, because the writers couldn't adequately show it in the previous episodes. And the, the, the way that they tell it to the audience they try and make it seem like this was in the plans all along, like her development had all been leading up to this by retroactively making things in the past seem like they were building towards the Mad Queen. When the Mad Queen arc just was very rushed and came out of nowhere. Have you ever written an English essay for your exams and gotten f to a point where you need to fill the page but you can't adequately make an argument. And so, you know, you, you're trying your best, but you have very weak evidence and justification. But then you use that weak evidence and justification and retroactively try to make it look as if this is adequate justification for your argument. You're making it seem like the argument, this great argument that you're having was there all along, when really the evidence wasn't there or sufficiently supplied, and it's just a shit argument. It's kind of like that. There wasn't appropriate time for the Mad Queen. There was no justification, very little, if any, for her to turn into the Mad Queen. I think it was just this season alone where they properly turned her to the dark side with cookies. Then they try and reverse engineer certain dialogue, like like breaking the wheel, like liberating the people. Then they change the context of how she's saying it to now. Now when she's saying liberating the people, she means burning all the men, women and children alive, like she's toasting sausages on a barbecue. That is what she means now, whereas in the past it meant that she was freeing these men, women and children. But they've changed the context to make it seem like her intentions were always to be this mad queen, when they weren't. So what they've done is they've retroactively applied an argument to weak, to insufficient evidence to make it look like they had an argument that Danny did become the mad queen. It's just annoying. This wouldn't have happened if they just spent more time on the episodes, like, you know, had another season, like HBO might have suggested, and George might have suggested. My second problem with this scene between Tyrion and Jon Snow is Tyrion doesn't really create a convincing argument. Up until the very end, Jon Snow's very much on Danny's side. 
as stubborn as he is, and there just wasn't enough time for John to develop into this opposing view of, yes, I must kill Danny. I needed to see more of his struggle. It felt like it wasn't earned. It felt like it happened too fast, and it happened because the writers wanted it to happen rather than it happening organically. When Walder Frey betrayed the Starks in The Red Wedding, he came to that decision organically. First of all, Rob Stark betrayed his trust, and as a greedy man, hungry for power, the Lannisters offered him something, and they appealed to a weakness or, or a character flaw of Walder Frey. So he arrived at the decision to kill everyone at the Red Wedding organically, and it felt like that was appropriate for the character. I could see the setup and the payoff. And for this, for this speech between Tyrion and Jon, it felt like despite how much they were trying to tell me that Queen Danny is the Mad Queen and that Jon should kill her, that they didn't organically reach the point where Jon had to kill the Mad Queen. It didn't feel like it was in character for any of them. So we go th from that to Queen Daenerys and Jon at the throne room. I mean, it's a nice looking scene. I, it doesn't make sense, really. It doesn't really make sense that paranoid Danny, who outright says to Jon, you can't trust anyone, paraphrasing, of course, that she would allow Jon to come in armed with a dagger. You'd think she'd have tighter security, you know? After 9-11, Jon stabs her in the heart. Then the dragon comes, and this is really where it just went fucking nuts. Dragons being as, as dumb as the writers, which is to say, as dumb as bricks. It shouldn't have been able to, you know, make the connection between the two, I wouldn't have thought. But because the writers deemed it necessary, the dragon knows, John. I know you killed the queen, my queen. I'ma get you. And it it charges up and says, I'ma fire my laser. And instead, it does this fake out where instead of killing John, it starts <laughs> burning the, the Iron Throne? Why did it focus on the throne and then just leave? Well, symbolically, this is the most obvious representation of anything I've ever seen. It's so ham-fisted. The throne burns to symbolize how the, the, ch the chain, the cycle of tyranny has been broken. With the death of the Mad Queen, we now enter an era without tyranny. They contrived a moment that should not have happened. Are you kidding me? What? What was that? It makes no sense, but Queen Danny dies. John's taken into custody, off screen, naturally. Tyrion is taken to be executed in front of the, the lords, the land. Then they, it happens. They decide on who's king now. Tyrion makes a speech. And everyone just says, yep. I believe that, man. Tyrion could move mountains with his speeches, despite the fact that his speeches lack any nuance, subtlety, they're not really convincing, but because as he says the good thing, everyone claps and says, bravo, bravo, I've changed my mind, actually. I think Bran should be king. Bran becoming the king has very little evidence currently, I mean it may happen in George R. R. Martin's book, but currently there's very little evidence to suggest he would become the king, but because they tell you that because Tyrion, and the writers mainly, tell you that he should be king, then there's adequate justification. No, you have to, you have to have evidence, man. You have to provide something sufficient. You have to have an arc with Bran where, you know, he has some justification for becoming king. But instead, he just becomes king because Tyrion said he should become king, which is really, really unsatisfying. And, oh, the, the real kicker is when Bran just says, Everything happens as it's supposed to happen. Everything happened for the reason. The reason was to get to this point. It's like, well, no, 
actually. Things didn't happen for any reason, and then you magically arrived at that, this point. That's actually what happened. They elect Bran as king. Again, George may have thought of this ending and told them that. Apparently he did. But I'd imagine in the books, there would be adequate build-up, and not just six episodes, two of which are mostly action, which justifies dramatic changes in character, because they told you that their characters have changed when they haven't shown it. Uh, Tyrion goes to visit Jon and tells Jon he's going back to the Night's Watch, bitches! And so, like, oh. Oh, okay. What? Let me ask you, what was the point of this whole arc where Jon was supposed to be king? It's entirely pointless now, because the entire point of the Night's Watch is that it drips you of your title and your name and any right to the throne. So it just takes away all that John had been building up in the last season and a half, which was him becoming king. It just makes that irrelevant. So like, what? What? What was the point of John coming back to life? I, look, for the record, I fucking hated John coming back to life. I despised it with a passion. That the writers were willing to move mountains and part the Red Sea to allow things to happen so that they could appease audiences, like bringing back a character like Jon Snow. And now it's proven to be true, because if, if Jon was brought back for a reason, I could understand it, but he wasn't brought back for a reason. The reason that might have been justified was, you know, him killing the Night King. So that there was some kind of prophecy, so there was some kind of established reason for him to come back. But instead it just felt like he came back because the writers wanted him to come back and nothing more. He came back so he could fail to kill the Night King, fail to kill Cersei, and fail to become the king. And then just go back to doing what he was doing before. It's like, he could have just been dead. So it, it just feels like they've done a disservice to Jon Snow by just giving him back to the Night's Watch, betraying everything that they've built up to. Not surprising at this point. They're the, the masters of subversion. Unsatisfying subversion. So Jon says goodbye to his family. Jon asks, what are you going to do now? And Arya's like, I'm going to go travelling. It's my gap year, you see. Oh, okay. Where, where, where was this in her character before? Is she searching for purpose? Now that she's fulfilled her purpose, which she technically didn't fulfill because she maybe took one name off her list and then just abandoned the list, thus betraying her motives as a character. So she really achieved nothing she wanted to do. And now she's searching for a new purpose, perhaps? Is, is that what you're going for? I can see some justification in it. Like, she did travel to Bravos, rather than going back to see Jon and, and Winterfell and everything. But to be a pioneer of, of the explorers and, and travel abroad to places unmapped, it just feels like a bit of an odd, a bit of a stretch. Like, most, most people who do gap year just maybe go to Bali. So it... It kind of made sense, but I felt that there was more justification needed for her to go become this intrepid explorer. Sansa, she makes the North its own country, its own kingdom, and then names itself Queen. Okay. That was the one that I thought, yeah, sure, why not? That was appropriately set up. Jon goes back to the Night's Watch. Tyrion is named Hand of the King again. I don't know why anyone keeps choosing Tyrion. The only reason I can think of is because Tyrion's a fan favourite. So they need him to be in a position of power. Still influencing the show because people like to see him in the show. Tyrion has made so many dumb mistakes by now. Yeah, look at my other videos. I've justified it there. He's not Tyrion anymore. He's just some dumb asshole. And I don't know... I don't see why anyone would hire some dumb asshole to, to be anything more than, I don't know, a janitor? Not even that. You can, probably could even figure out how, which side of a mop to use. 
the emotional appeal and for the fan service, the writers have deemed that Bran should take this person on board, which is so dumb. Oh well. I like Tyrion. I did like Tyrion. Tyrion creates a small council, like we saw before, you know, with Master Pycelle, Varys, Littlefinger. How it was in the, the OG. <laughs> well, it was the first time that the characters were acting like their characters. Bronn was just being Bronn because he's the, the Lord of whatever now. They actually, the Mad Men, they actually made him the Lord of something. He became Master of Coin, and the interactions between the characters felt like an actual interaction between characters. So it was the first time they'd acted like human beings since the last season, season before that. And it ends with Jon Snow going out in a shot that is reminiscent of the original show, the very first episode where the Night's Watch are out in the forest and they find a Night Walker. Lads, the series is over. And after all I've said, all the arguments I've made justifying how the, the show's writing has dropped. It's a great show! Why? Because John petted his dog. He petted his doggo. I just subverted your expectations, didn't I? Because I established an argument that the show, the series, had lost its magic, and then I subverted it by not following the narrative I'd created. Like the showrunners for Game of Thrones. The only overwhelming emotion I got from this episode was on Wii. E-N-N-U-I. Listless dissatisfaction. It just... This was supposed to be the climax of the show, but it was so poorly handled that it didn't feel like the climax. It just felt like some confused, awkward flailing. And she's saying, put it in. And it's like, but where? And it's like, what there? And just end up getting soft and walking home during a cold night dissatisfied that's kind of, that's kind of game of thrones isn't it the the ending to the series the, this series was disappointing because this was a real chance to change television it was a show that was subversive in the right ways it appropriately set up all it was trying to do like the red wedding it set it up it didn't just subvert your expectations because fuck you it it subverted them in a satisfying way. But it, it was a subversive show that was well written, well handled, that had really cathartic moments and really sad moments, really a fully fleshed out world and fully realized that, and it subverted fantasy tropes. It could have taken the fantasy genre in a new direction and created this long enduring legacy for itself. Like say, Breaking Bad, where it's just the pinnacle of television, right? It's this epic show that everyone will remember as being epic, and the legacy that will last for Game of Thrones now is that it was turned into a Hollywood blockbuster filled with with spectacle and saccharine emotional moments that you couldn't look too hard at or or think about too much because then they just fall apart because logically those moments don't make sense, right? And they shouldn't have happened. So it's it just turned into this thing where you have to turn off your brain to enjoy the show. It became schlock. Don't look too hard at it now because the show turned into something all about instant gratification, inconsistent characters who became nothing more than plot drivers who undermine the character's key elements and personalities for the sake of the plot. And my god, man, the plot armor. For characters that were liked, the plot armor was so thick that they could survive an entire city falling on their head. Or, you know, the, the show now ignoring its logic and ignoring its rules to make these emotional payoffs, which shows that the writers are precious about preserving their ideas, even if they're terrible and they don't work for the show and they don't make sense. The lack of setup and payoff, the, the fan fiction levels of writing that was in this show towards the end. The show came to be more about f focusing on relationships between characters, and which is 
by the way, the premise of a soap opera with generic villains that were bland, that had very, that had terrible motives, if no motives at all. In this, this story about good and evil, in George's universe, there wasn't really a truly evil person. There was just a misguided person, which is so much more interesting. But now we just have these generic villains and this generic fantasy with generic plot lines and generic romance, generic everything. Game of Thrones had the chance to truly buck trends. It could have shown producers a new avenue that television could go in where these boring saccharine generic things we've seen could be subverted and the audience would still appreciate it. But instead, Game of Thrones became this generic home brand Hollywood fantasy which you shouldn't think too hard about, otherwise it'll stop making sense. If you want to see evidence of this, I've got three videos on it, from which span from about 20 to 48 minutes. And they cover mo more of these topics in depth. Felt like it was rushed to a conclusion. So it wasn't even good levels of generic because at times the quality was, of the writing was so bad that even even people who don't want to think about it are forced to think about how illogical the plot is. The, the coffee cup. I really appreciate that the writers of this series took on the books. They took on George R. R. Martin's work and they said, we'll do it. We think that this can be something. And they produced the show. I have admiration for that. But then, I really wish that there's an alternate universe where these writers decided to give up their producing and writing roles and they handed it off to someone else to produce the show. Someone who was, sad to say, more talented at writing than them. Someone who had more time to dedicate to the show than them. Someone who was more willing to persevere with the show than them. But that's not the world we live in. We live in the world where these writers exist and this show exists with the quality that it does. It's a real shame, man. But I'd like to give kudos where it's due. The writing may not have been good, but I'm sure we can all appreciate the cinematography, all of the technical aspects, the acting, all good. Uh, the music, but it just goes to show how Bad writing can not only ruin a show, but ruin its, its legacy. Quick channel announcement. I'm going to be continuing to do some more video essay type things in this format. So don't you worry about that. I'm going to tackle a couple of shows. One Punch Man, Attack on Titan. I'm going to continue to do some RimWorld. Uh, my PC is being a, a, a bitch, so I can't continue with Sunless Skies for a little bit. But I will get back to that eventually. The next RimWorld episode will be a little bit because I'm in a middle in the middle of a really hectic time in my life, and really I don't have time. Sekiro review is perhaps thirty no maybe twenty percent through. Thank you everyone so much for coming along and uh, listening to me moan have some cathartic moments. I've enjoyed your company. I hope you've found something out of this series. I've, I've tried my best to not just nitpick. I've tried to give constructive criticisms. Yes, there's been some ad hominems which haven't been useful, like attacking the writers for being dumb. But that, so I'm sorry for that, but I've tried to keep it more constructive and focus on things that maybe everyone could learn from, you know? see some some writing flaws that if you are a writer yourself or you're a creative then you could see this and perhaps go all right well guess i shouldn't do that then so i've tried to focus on the bigger problems rather than just small finicky things to, so we can better learn and grow as a community we'll see if that that's helpful at all um thank you everyone ta-ta